Hello ladies, welcome to The Mance and to Homemaking Radio. I'm Lydia Ruth. Please click the link in the description box below on this channel and go to the page where I have embedded this on a post. And that way you can see the other things that I referred to in my talk. And you will see the links and you will see the uh, quotes and maybe some of the scripture references that I got wrong. And the uh, pictures of other places in the manse or maybe the dress and apron I was wearing. These things aren't important, but I want to just bring you away from the bad news of the world and the cortisol they're giving us and let you relax a little bit with some of the good things about the home and homemaking. And hopefully you can get as close to the example as you can uh, when we're talking about it biblically. Before I go on, I wanted to tell you that I wouldn't, I'm not able yet to send out this book to those of you who asked for it um, because we're having uh, to change a few things at the printers. Uh, it comes from a disc and it's printed off and then sent to me. And uh, so, well, we, well, well, it's not a homemaking book. I know you probably expect that. It's, a, it's a, about my childhood. My mother and father and I wrote it and uh, we... Um, and we published it. The, the pages are wonderful. The scenery is wonderful, but it's all it's all outlined by God's provision and protection for us in those days. And and uh, you know, there's there's a moose. <laughs> and I have to tell you, we had a saying, and that was, uh, when you see one, you don't make eye contact. You turn around and you walk away slowly. You don't want to stir them up. And um, reminds me of Let Sleeping Dogs Lie. And I had a lot of fun with uh, one of my descendants mixing up all these sayings. And uh, one of them was, uh, don't cry over spilt milk. And I said, let's have a little fun mixing them up. And so he, he said, let the sleeping dogs drink the spilt milk. <laughs> we had all kinds of mix-ups about uh, with the, with these old sayings and if I can remember some of them I didn't record any of them, didn't even write them down we were just uh, so busy living life we didn't have time to uh, text it so <laughs> I will try to include that on the post so go over there to listen to this and then you can see all the other things if you watch it over here on YouTube it's not the same but I have uh, several things to talk to you about today, and the first thing, of course, is to get get yourself ready. Get your face and hair fixed up and get bathed and dressed and start out like a new person. You know, that's one thing that homeschool helped me with. I discovered that the children now had time to take their time in the bathroom and uh, get to know who they were by what their eyes reflected. You know, your eyes are either innocent or hard or... Uh, you know, sometimes you can tell your health by your eyes and you can tell your love of life and pay attention to themselves when they're fixing themselves up in the mirror. And I say to the same thing to you, get yourself ready, get your attitude right, and your appearance will help. If you dress up like everybody else, the home is just going to see seem like some place where everybody just kind of hangs out, but it doesn't have a deeper meaning. So I always dressed up for my home, and even though people will reject it, I clung to it because it was like someone could be made could make fun of me. That could intimidate me quite easily. But then I discovered that if I clung to it, after a while, uh, they would accept it. People would accept it, dressing up for the home. And I, I do housework. Um, and if you can't do housework in something nice, I don't understand how you can uh, say that you have to wear, you know, all these track clothes and everything like that. Because uh, it just takes a, a different movement. It takes a little bit of grace. Um, but I think if you read some of Emily Barnes' books, she promotes this quite a bit. She had... Um, something called uh, The Spirit of Loveliness, a book called Spirit of Loveliness, another one called Welcome Home. She wrote quite a few, and uh, she did mention in several places about the importance of being 
uh, beautiful for your home. And, you know, it's a contradiction, isn't it, when we uh, have beautiful homes. Most of you are doing a lot better than I am and have beautiful houses and homes. And at least you can dress up to go with. At least you can represent the home that you... We were always taught when we were growing up back in the 50s and the 40s and the olden days um, that you represent the home you came from. And home, of course, biblically means family and dwelling put together. And so I have a... I have some homemaking things to talk to you about. This is not a homemaking site. It's just a site about contentment and happiness and motivation for the home. And uh, years ago, I, when I first got married, I was in a, a kind of a ranch-style home, and it was just as very ugly and didn't have pretty curtains. I grew up, you know, where your mother made curtains from the calico flower sacks and um, they had doilies and they had, you know, little pretty things in the home that, that made it softer and made it a home. And uh, here come the 1970s and that, that was nowhere to be seen. And so the house I moved into did not have any of these niceties and, and I didn't know where to go uh, at the time for some reason. And so I started looking up in the, the big yellow pages in the phone book for interior decorators. And I thought, well, they'll, they'll know. They'll have different styles you can choose from and, and maybe a package deal or something. And when I went to them, it, it, w it wasn't at all what I, what I needed. Um, you had to measure your, your windows for drapery and then order curtains or something. But they didn't really have any advice or good things for a young, young woman that just wanted to, you know, take the rough edges off of a very plain house. And uh, now they have a cottage core, and you can go on Pinterest and see a lot of cottage core. And don't forget to go visit me on cottage core because I've got, I mean, on Pinterest because I have a lot of pictures that I saved that you might be inspired by. What I needed was someone to tell me that you could still, the granny chick now is coming out, but that you could still use your grandmother's things and still have a pretty home. But uh, back in those days, everything was so modern, and all the young Marys uh, had modern things. And so I needed to know how to use things like that to make the home pretty. And I had a friend that sent me these, uh, I'm trying to think what the year was on these. Um, sometimes they didn't put the year on these patterns. But they were called Sunrise Designs. And here's one of them. And I will put this on the page that I embedded this video. So you can see how much they inspired me to think of what I could do. It was using cloth to make, even cloth to make things to hang on the wall. You didn't have to go out and buy pictures, in other words. And uh, she knew I sewed and that I had cloth. I could get cloth. And uh, there's even a, a doorstop cat here. It has a brick or something in the bottom of it. And uh, there were, there's other things like a plant pot uh, covered in pretty cloth to coordinate with everything. So you didn't have to worry about it. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me. I needed to know how to do this. And then there were more. Uh, that She sent me a whole bunch of them. This was called Living Room Retreat. And this is in blues. And this was Sunrise Designs. I believe it was probably from the 1980s, late 1970s. And it even the even this little wall hanging, you could make those frames out of fabric and cardboard and hang them up. And so if you want to look this up, it's called Sunrise Designs. Um, and they were from House of Fabrics, Sofro Fabrics. And they were made for a fabric store, I think. And, and the, that way, we learned how to take uh, take fabric and do things with that, or or just uh, you know the whole principle of it was to make it look lovely. And here's another one called the daybed ensemble. Well, the idea of a daybed is that it's it was a couch and a seating area, but you could also make it into part of your living room. And there is a little lampshade cover so that you could make your your lamp look pretty and kind of coordinate with everything else. There again is the uh, hanging with the photographs on it. And uh, 
and there's a hat with and there even had a pattern in one of them to actually make the hat that hung on the wall and uh, there's a ribbon and, and there's fabric flowers you could make and what a joy I had there's even a little stack of books here and you could make covers for the books and then tie the books up with another strip of cloth uh, and what a joy I had doing that and I will never ever part with these because they just helped my life so much at a time when it felt kind of bleak and uh, so for homemaking that's what I wanted to talk to you about but I do have more serious things uh, to talk to you about today if you uh, would like to support me uh, I just appreciate it so much it's in fact a lady uh, sometimes sends me five dollars in the mail and I want to tell you that when Hobby Lobby has this thread on sale, I go and buy one of these with that gift money because there are 1,094 yards in it. And I believe uh, a dress probably has, if it's kind of a dress that I make, maybe a little less than 100 yards of, fa of sewing thread in it. So that means I could make uh, quite a few quite a, if there's a 1,094 yards and uh, it's not a hundred yards it's more like 10 yards in a dress so I can make you know dresses for a long time with this and I, I particularly like white and uh, so every little little bit helps and and so it, and then it also gives me a little more time to come here and do these broadcasts because I can uh, I can buy the things that I need to take care of everything else. Now, ladies, I do want to read more today, uh, wives and daughters, but I have a very serious item that I want to talk to you about, and that is the homemaking and the homemakers. And so I want to read something that I'm going to print on here, I hope. I uh, wrote it recently. And... Um, So here it is, and it's called Ruth. Okay, so Ruth. Now, unfortunately, we still have, we're still fighting the moderns that are saying a woman uh, can work outside the home and it won't do any harm. And Helen Andelin had a really, and her husband wrote a book called Man of Steel and Velvet, and it, he had a chapter called Harm in Women Working, where he outlined the neglect of children and the neglect of what if they even if they didn't have children the neglect of the family and the home and then getting the woman's mind on something else it's much like school when you go to school your mind is tuned into their agenda all the time you don't really think for yourself your creativity um, is put aside while you do uh, what that system while you follow that system well it's the same with uh, working outside the home and people like to argue with me all the time so I decided to put some of the arguments to rest and today I'm going to read to you about about what I wrote about the book of Ruth because they like to use the book of Ruth as oh Ruth she went and worked in in a stranger's field and a lot of these people don't really study this out too carefully so I'm going to read it to you if you've got young girls who are giving you a bit of a challenge and they want to go somewhere else and work uh, I remember I'll just have to stop for a minute I remember back in the day those of you who are vital will know this the men used to say um, as long as you're living here you won't be working outside the home or no daughter of mine is going to get a job it was considered quite common you know and the man would say no wife of mine is ever going to work outside the home because he wouldn't have exposed her to that. He didn't want people uh, talking to her and looking at her all day long. He wanted her to have a quiet life at home and privacy. But now, of course, they analyze you as um, either social or unsocial and, and they try to get you out. And I could go on and on about it, but I want to make a little more sense. So I will read what I wrote to you about this. Ruth did not work in a stranger's field. She merely picked up food and grain on a relative's land that had already been cut and left on the corners of the field for the poor. This was called the harvester's drop. That's where, see I live on farmland, so I see what they do. They cut everything. 
Now, they might leave something on a corner for someone else to pick up that was already cut, but they cut everything. And the custom of the time of Ruth, especially in the Jewish religion at the time, which this was written, uh, was to leave what was dropped, what the harvesters dropped on the corners for the poor to pick up. Okay, so let me continue here. So this was called the harvester's drop, and they were not supposed, I can read it to you out of Leviticus when I get finished, where they said, do not take what the harvesters have left, um, but leave that for the poor. These drops were not to be picked up by the harvesters after, the, after they had cut everything. They were not to be picked up, but left for the gleaners to pick it up or the poor, or the gleaners for the poor. Now, we have gleaners up here in Oregon. They basically go to uh, grocery stores that have left, put some aside for the poor, and the gleaners pick them up and then distribute it to, to people they know that need it. And those are called gleaners. It's a stretch to say Ruth had a job to justify women getting jobs outside of home. She was picking up something left for her she wasn't getting paid. It was not labor such as the harvesters were doing. She was getting a free gift. Now, no one can argue that uh, if this is similar to the plan of salvation in the New Testament when we read in Scripture that it is a free gift, not earned by works. But we still have to open it. We still have to go get it. We have to collect it. Um, we have to be willing, you know. We still have to go and get the free provision. Ruth went to get the free provision, the free gift. And do not forget the actual point of that history. That Ruth had accepted her mother-in-law's religion and was following the Jewish law of meeting her deceased husband's kin to marry. So Naomi had to expose her to him. And she sent her to glean in his field to put her in contact with Boaz, a relative. Further, her compliance with that religion gave her the privilege of being an ancestor to the future Savior. So people don't see the big picture. They'll go in and they'll find all these characters and, and find one thing about them and say, oh yeah, well I... And instead of looking at Scripture to see what I can do and what how close I can get to doing it, as close to the model as possible, people look for loopholes and everything to get around it. And, uh, and then they want to argue with me. And I'll say, well, you know, you have to reach your own convictions of what you want to do. And you can also look around you and see what has happened to people who have decided to go the other way. And uh, I will read to you about some of these books here that even in history, it, you know, uh, this idea of working outside of the home. Uh, it's, it's not really based in history unless the husband and father were dead. Um, and do not forget the actual point of that history, I said. Now, I'm going to use some labels here that you won't like, and I don't mean to for you to get anxiety over it. Leftists, communists, modernists, liberals, and weak men and women have always attempted to use Ruth, Proverbs 31, Deborah, the midwives, Lydia, Dorcas, and other Bible women as proof that women are just as rugged as men and can work hard and men do not need to support them. Rather, they substitute the responsibility of the fathers and husbands to be providers and they say uh, the job, the girl's job will be the provider. And I will read to you more about that. Many a young lady, approved by weak parents, will argue that a job has many merits and that Ruth had a job. But Ruth's husband, her father and father-in-law, the providers, were dead. Most young homeschoolers, fathers and brothers and grandparents, are not dead. Gleaning was God's provision for those women without providers. Modernists read Ruth with a preconceived indoctrination that here is a woman who had a job and they do not see the message of faith. She actually didn't have a job. She didn't get paid for it. Um, and free food is not the same as a job. 
Modernists focus on safety. They'll say, well, it's a safe place to work. Or want to. Well, she wants to. Or opportunities. It's an opportunity for her to be trained in this or that or the other thing. Or her to, It's an opportunity for her to go and work in a business. It's an opportunity. They use those things as guides. Safety, want to's, and opportunities. They use those things as guides and criteria rather than scripture that was designed to put women in the home. You've seen that phrase, keepers at home. Uh, and you can find it in 1 Timothy 5.14 and Titus 2. But don't forget, there are, there are messages to men just as strong in Titus 2. Uh, not to be keepers at home, but a separate role. It's written to two people. It's written to the men and to the women. A lot of people focus on Titus 2 just for the women, but there's messages to men in there too. And they have to be stable and sound-minded, and they cannot twist scripture. Uh, Modernists focus on, safe, focus on safety or want to's or opportunities as guides rather than scripture that was designed to put women in the home where they loving, lovingly work. Oh, we're not questioning work, are we? They work, create, provide care and concern for others, and even earn money. Yes, we, we can earn money at home. They want the young single women out there, though. Homemaking is hard work. And it builds a uh, hearty character and steadfastness and all that. A lot of people will attack me and say, work is good for people. Like I don't, like I object to work. You know, homemaking is work. And many house husbands have even discovered this, that is work. Modernists refuse to view this mandate to be keepers, which in the Greek is managers at home as a matter of faith. They continue to say, uh, I already know how to keep house, instead of embracing it as a, a lifelong lifestyle, ongoing act of faith, and a spiritual response to Christ. It would be just as nonsensical to learn how to worship on the Lord's Day, and after a few Sundays say, I already know how to worship, I don't have to do it anymore. We all agree it's part of being faithful. And it's part of an ongoing, learning, growing lifestyle, just like homemaking. It doesn't end. I mean, young girls tell me, well, see, I can, I, I can take care of it. I already know how to, you know, do this and do that. And I already know how to. But it's a learning experience. What are you going to do when you have your own home? If you say that, nothing will get done. When men approve of their daughters working in other places or, of business, they are putting themselves and their daughters at spiritual risk of violating scriptures. Now, people will argue with me all the time about saying, well, it's a safe place, because they assume that me raising my daughter at home meant that I was trying to protect her from the workplace. Uh, that wasn't the reason, because what if the workplace becomes safe? That, that can't be the reason. So it's not about protecting and safety. It's about doing your spiritual duty before God. It depends on whether you believe it or not. It's a test of your belief, too. Uh, a lot of it comes from the refusal of Christian men to take their role seriously. Let's listen to 1 Timothy 5, 8. If anyone fails to provide for his own, and especially for those of his own family, he has denied the faith by disregarding its precepts and is worse than an unbeliever who fulfills his obligation in these matters. You know, an unbeliever fulfills his obligation in this matter. He, he's doing it because it's wise. Um, so he's worse than an unbeliever. Now, I'm going to go back and read you something that uh, some of these answers that I'm getting so that you maybe they figure out your own. Here, let me see if I can find it. Um Okay, so here's the list uh, that I've been collecting for a while. And this is one of the answers that I get. It's a good thing for a young person to get a job and work. It teaches them about who they are. Now notice this, this person that wrote that to me did not say woman, a young person. Because, of course, I can't disagree with that. I couldn't argue with it. Well, yeah. To get a job, well, 
uh, someone else might have to get a job, but he didn't say his daughter, or she didn't say her daughter. Uh, it was a young person, and so they they make it, you know, they kind of gloss over it so that I can't say anything about it. It teaches them about who they are. Well, ladies, our character teaches us about who we are, and the scriptures is are to guide our character, and we follow them, and that... Um, we support it. We support the scripture. And as the scripture, you support what it says. It's, it supports you back. And uh, then here's the other objection. Working helps people to be humble and hearty. Well, who would object to that? Well, that's the answer some people give me uh, regarding keepers at home and young, young women at home, you know, when they're with their family and they're not married yet. And you have to realize that just even up to recent times, maybe 70 years ago, a girl stayed at home with her father's, in her father and mother's home, and then went to her husband's home. There wasn't that in-between time where they were free to go and do this and that and party and and uh, even uh, in a room with a view. You remember Mrs. Honeychurch, she said, Lucy said, I've come in, I'll be coming into my money soon, and I thought I'd might like to get a job in London. And Mrs. Honeychurch was so stricken and hurt, she said, to march about with typewriters and latch keys and call it work, because to her, work was was the home and the property and all this. And, and oh, she was so disappointed in her daughter talking like that, because that was just was so contrary to uh, what she had been taught and what she grew up seeing. She said to march about with typewriters and latch keys and call it work. And uh, and I have a, the book. Uh, the movie is not, I wouldn't recommend the, not the new movie, but the old movie from the 1980s of A Room with a View. Some of it is okay. Don't watch it unless you're vital. Unless you're over 70, I won't let you watch that movie. But it has a good message in it. Um, there will always be something that is not good in some of these, but I wouldn't recommend it for your daughters uh, unless you can somehow um, somehow change some things in it. But the book was okay. All right. So this was written in the 1800s. To march about with typewriters and latch keys and call it work. <laughs> um, so working helps. Uh, this is one of these answers. Working helps people to be humble and hearty. Well, why would I even object to that? Well, sure I do. But working at home is still work. Okay, so I've never objected to that. I've never said it was wrong for a young person to get a job and work. I'm just talking about women at home and young women at home. Their job is their work at home, and their father can pay them. For uh, for instance, I once offered uh, one of my grandchildren to pay her to, to take care of the kitchen for a week because her mother just couldn't get out of the kitchen. She had so much to do, and she, her mother wants to do a few other things. She wants to make cards. She wants to sew. She wants to write newsletters. So I offered to compensate and pay the granddaughter to do, do that to free up her mother's time. A laborer is worthy of his hire. Kids are not free coolie labor. I've always paid my kids something for work, ex except if it was something that was their duty, like to pick up after themselves, clean up their own room, uh, brush their teeth, um, washing their own clothes, uh, helping with supper. But if it was another type of job, like I want you to take over the this certain area of the house or I want you to clean out the bookshelf, I would pay them because I don't want I don't want people to get the idea when they see that my children can work, that they'll get them, uh, my children go work for them for free. So a laborer is worthy of his hire and I paid my children to, uh, to teach them that. And I don't even, like my grandchildren came and put in a new window for me, and I did compensate them for their travel and uh, other expenses because I don't want them to get the idea that they're going to um, uh, provide all this stuff for me for nothing. Um, so, and, and people will disagree with me about that. That's the way it is. A laborer is worth his hire. So, Here's what this person says. Working helps people be humble and hearty. It helps them teach them empathy for their fellow man. Huh? Hard work gives us rugged character. Well, the work at home gives people empathy and appreciation for the providers at home and for 
uh, their siblings and for and they teach them it teaches them how to serve and it does give them sympathy um, number three teaching uh, to be keepers at home is now listen to this this was going around in the 60s I wasn't born yesterday kids you can't give me this jive and and intimidate me or knock me over with it teaching to be keepers at home is cloistering in a citadel in fear of the world look that was going on in the 60s. People were giving us that stuff, cloistering in a citadel in fear of the world. You know, when you've got little children and you bring them into your house and you say, I'm not going to go out, I'm not going to take this baby out shopping and I'm not going to, you know, we're going to uh, just stay in, in the house. We're safe. We don't want to get sick and everything. Is that cloistering in a citadel in fear of the world? And this person said, cloistering in a citadel in fear of the world makes kids grow up sick. Huh? Well, I know a lot of stay-at-home fathers who work at home, and they earn money, and they're good providers, and they're sick, so uh, maybe they're the ones that need to go out to work. See, this stuff makes me mad. Um, so here's another one. You are flat wrong to bind all that baggage from the three words, keepers at home, onto this simple verse. It calls it baggage. I didn't know how to answer that. Number five, are you suggesting that women who work outside the home as well as inside the home are heretics? No, I just said, many of us earn money at home, always have. My daughter made uh, little quilts for people and she also wrote a little newsletter and people give her donations for it. Uh, but she she didn't work at it like it was a, uh, a job or a labor. It was only something she could do uh, when she was good and ready to do it. Now, uh, and I wasn't just using that one verse. There's another one, 1 Timothy 5.14, that says the young women should uh, be keepers of, keepers of the home. And, uh, and the Greek word was women, although some of the versions of the Bible use that word widow. The actual Greek word was women. Um, and, and also sometimes it's uh, translated as ones. Uh, so here's... You're going to be interested in this one. Are you prepared to limit yourself to doing no more than what you read in Scripture? Where did anyone watch YouTube in the Bible? Huh? Well, where did anyone use a vacuum cleaner or a washing machine or flush a toilet in the Bible? Where did anyone use a toilet brush? Kids, I mean, this stuff is old hippie stuff. And it's crept back in to our culture out there. And, 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 of course, the culture creeps into the church. You can't get one church member, even in some of the most conservative churches, to back up uh, the keepers at home and, and homeschooling and, and women being lovers of the home. And many times uh, I'll find a scripture that says workers at home. We're supposed to work at home as women and with our own hands, minding our own business. When you go out to work, you're minding somebody else's business. And it, you can't serve two masters because if you do, if you work outside the home, you're either going to put all of your strength and vigor into that and be too tired at home and neglect the home. Or you're going to put the home first and then give less than your best at work. It doesn't, it just doesn't work the way you think it will, okay? Uh, the heart of a woman's work is with her family. Now that's to throw me off, like, oh, now I'm going to relax. This person is going to, you know, agree with me. Uh, however, it is not a test of faithfulness that would keep her under house arrest. It is not a test of test of faithfulness to keep her under house arrest, huh? Is a man working at home with his computer in his office at home under house arrest? Here's where the problem is. They don't think that being home is work for women, but it is. We may sit down sometimes like this, read a book or sew something or or just enjoy life or uh, play the piano or do some art. But uh, and, and I don't think women feel that they are under house arrest. I'll tell you what house arrest was, was during that uh, so-called uh, shutdown where a lot of people learned what it was like to be at home and some of them actually felt more free at home. Um, but this person accused me of using uh, the scripture and the phrase keepers at home for young women as a uh, as house arrest. 
And that, that stuff was going out around in the 60s, you know, kids. Uh, but this person evidently is not a person of faith. Um, so now let's go to the next one. You are taking that scripture to a super extreme level and making a whole new religion out of it. Oh, you know, uh, what about that scripture that says a man should provide for his own? Most men in churches believe a man should be the provider, I think. Uh, does he think that scripture is uh, just taken out of context and there's a whole new religion out of it because he works eight hours a day? Look, kids, women work more than a man do, does in hours because she's on call even in the middle of the night. She works all the time. Um, and even when you're getting ready and you're trying to relax and you're bathing and you're doing your hair and everything, it's, it's an effort. It's, it's actually work because you're getting ready to do your work. And uh, it's, a, it's a life. You know, I read so much to you out of this book here, which I just love this book, but some of it I can't read aloud because she's so, uh, she's so harsh with her words and, and sometimes graphic. But um, she said in here, it's about the Victorian women, that to them, their whole life was their religion. They did not uh, take uh, their worship and say, that's my religion. It just permeated everything. Life was religion. Homemaking was religion. Family was religion. Uh, their whole life uh, was religion, like an elixir. And... Um, so here's one you're going to get a big kick out of. Let's see how you would answer this. Now this this person must have come from a family that had these this mentality that was breaking down. Uh, but see, it's been going on since the early 1900s. The the flappers and uh, the people from the 1900s were busy smashing. She said in this book they were busy smashing the old ways, the Victorian ways of the home and the family. And so this sounds like something that might have come from a long time ago, uh, but I particularly did hear it in the 60s from the men coming out of the colleges who came out less than masculine out of the colleges. Men that went into college that I knew as a young person as being uh, rugged um, pioneer type, type men coming out of college being weak and uh, not really having the same pride of caring for a family. But here it is. Um, you don't take scripture seriously, and he's referring to those three words, keepers at home. You don't take scripture seriously if you twist it into handcuffs. So what he's saying is, if you believe in the keepers at home uh, life, then uh, you are handcuffing it. You're handcuffing the scripture. Uh, you're not giving it any freedom. But those of you who are truly lovers of the home and workers at home, I believe there is a scripture that talked about lovers of the home um, and I can't find it right now but I just wanted to talk to you about this to see and I, if you like I can list this wacky list on my blog and you can answer it for me maybe I will reprint it with your answers on there so here's another one you are turning this into some kind of prohibition on any kind of employment outside the home well the thing is not any kind of employment outside of the home because previous to that she said uh, you're saying that inside and outside of the home a woman can't work, can't be employed. No, she can be, but you have to figure out what she's going to be doing and where she's going to be doing it. Home is the place and um, keepers meaning managers, so managing the home can involve many different things. It could be homeschooling your children. It could be teaching someone else in your home. It could be um, maybe making something to earn money. But I found for myself, my husband told me, I'll read you what my husband told me. I wrote it down because he told me this when, when he first met me or when we first got married. Um, but I'll finish this first and then I'll go back and tell you what my what Mr. S said okay okay kids if you've got something to do go ahead and go do it and I hope I'm not um, now a lot of you will say uh, and you leave it in the comments oh your voice soothes me oh you looked so you know young and pretty today look this computer is giving me the benefit of the doubt and it's very kind to me because in real life I don't sound like this and I don't look like this <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, 
So you don't take scripture seriously if you twist it into handcuffs, huh? You know, they always want to say something that's kind of nonsensical and it gets you off of the subject. Okay, the other thing that this person had texted me one time was that um, scripture doesn't support your view. Look, scripture doesn't have to support anything I do, but I have to support the scripture. And the way that I support it is by doing it. And then... Uh, it becomes my support. Okay, kids? Okay. Now, another thing they'll do is they'll turn, since you got that from Titus 2, they'll say, it's really mainly about older women, and your behavior does not match it because you are a slanderer because you disagree with me. <laughs> um, and you're undermining uh, my view. Uh, you know, and uh, so then they'll, they will go to the keepers at home and they'll say, well, it says keepers at home, yes, but it applies to you. Is your house clean? Well, my house is never clean. No house is ever completely clean. Someone wrote to me recently and said, it's never done. There's always something to do. So a girl that will say, oh, well, I, I already know how to do this, but do you know how to do it 30 days in a row? Do you know how to do it when you're not feeling well? Do you know how to... Uh, manage things when someone in the family is sick do you know how to manage things when there's no money there's a lot more to it so now I'm going to read what I what my mr. s said to me many years ago and it here it is I used to be concerned about money and feel guilty about staying home even though my mother was a, a stay-at-home mother Many people of that era were, uh, and I was brought up to be a keeper at home uh, because the 60s hit and everybody was going to work. I remember how devastated I felt when I saw one by one the ladies at church going to work to put their children through a Christian college and uh, because their children would be gone. And uh, so I started to worry about it after I got married. Well, everybody else was working and I was home, and he said, My dear... I will take care of you. I'll get a second job if necessary. You will never have to work outside the home, and I'll give you spending money. And a lot of these parents will say, well, my daughter's just working, you know, so many hours a week for spending money. If she needs spending money, pay her to, to take over some part of the house, the bathroom, the kitchen, the laundry, the cooking, the meals, whatever. I know one young homeschool girl that for one of her brother's birthday, a working brother that has to leave every morning really early uh, to a place of work, um, she make, made him for his birthday a month's supply, you know, uh, one of those coupons, a month's supply of, of carry-out lunches so that he can reach in the fridge in the morning and he can get this packed lunch. Uh, because he, he didn't like fi getting up. He'd have to get up extra early to fix it, or he'd have to fix it the night before, and he just didn't enjoy it. So uh, there's, and then you know, he gives her a little money. He leaves a little money in the fridge for her. <laughs> uh, so here it is. Then he handed me my Bible, my cookbook, and a favorite book on the, on houses. I like, you know, house to look at house designs, and I like to look at interiors and stuff. And he said, don't worry. Now, this was a phrase, a common phrase. Don't worry your pretty little head about it. Nowadays, that would be considered chauvinist uh, or whatever, whatever they're labeling it now. Uh, he said, just take these, just do the things that are in this book. Just worry about what's in here, you know. And then he said, uh, just sit around and look pretty. Go to the grocery store and get what you need to cook. Uh, we'll eat well, and you can, if you don't feel like doing anything, you can sit around and look pretty. But people said things like that in those days, you know. These days, if you said that to someone, well, my husband just told me not to worry about it, just sit around and look pretty. They'll go around uh, blasting this stuff around and saying, well, all she does is sit, she's just an ornament on her husband's arm. I mean, all this exaggeration. They'll make fun of the poets and everything. Um, they don't understand figures of speech like, uh, exaggeration and irony and embellishment and um, and things like that, double meanings and stuff like that, that people today don't understand that. Uh, but, you know, reading the scriptures, reading the Bible, there's a lot of figures and speech in here, some of my favorite things. 
So he said, uh, take care of the house, do my laundry, make nice dresses, teach the children, plan trips and outings, correspondence, that's all. And yet, so many men would send their daughters and wives out for part-time jobs for spending money, which isn't a real necessity if any man provide not for his own. You know, I still remember the, the men of the old, the grandparents. I, I'm old enough to remember great-great-grandparents that were born in the 1800s. And they would say, uh, no daughter of mine will ever have to work outside. The, and they weren't rich. I'll give her the spending money. But they did not want their daughters out there uh, exposed to everybody. Those of you who have ever had to work uh, in the commercial era, no, you get awful tired of it. You get awful tired of talking to people, seeing people, and them seeing you. You just you just totally lose your um, your privacy in a way, having your face out there. And um, so here we go. Um, again, if if the man can't afford it, you as a mother or grandmother can offer to help them to do right. I'll I'll compensate you or pay you to help more at at your home or something. Um, I don't think anything's wrong with that. Of course, we want them to have a deep desire so you don't have to pay them off. You just want them to have the desire. But I don't think it hurts to help them to do what's right. Um, but, of course, we want to embed in them the desire to do it. Um, sometimes homemaking and being at home is too confining and too strict for people who are going the way of the culture. Now, I have to tell you one thing. Someone who goes the way of the culture, with all those strange arguments I just read to you, uh, the culture supports it. And, you know, you can't even get, if you were desperate and you wanted someone to talk to uh, a mother or a husband or your uh, what, or your father to talk them, tell them what, the, show them the way more perfectly from the scripture, you couldn't get a church member to do it because they just they don't know where to find it. They've never studied it, and they don't believe it anyway. They go the way the culture supports this attitude of sending women out to work. The culture supports it, so you won't have a battle. I'll be the only battle you have if, uh, uh, and, and people will feel threatened by it. But you shouldn't feel threatened by my attitude because the culture is on your side. The church is on your side. The whole uh, entertainment industry is on your side. Um, the world is on your side. Business is on your side. The colleges are on your side. Education is on your side. Um, so, you know, you don't have to worry about me. You don't have to talk back to me because uh, I'm just a little woman at home, you know. And uh, people started making fun of that years ago. So it's too confining and strict for people who go the way of the culture and not the way of the Lord. We don't see it as confining and strict. Remember Mrs. Bennett? Uh, Mr. Darcy said, You don't find country living confined and unvarying. And Mrs. Bennett just blew up in his face. And she said, Confined and unvarying? I'll have you know we dine with two and twenty families. Um, they, they could do consider it confined and unvarying. But what is sitting in a cubicle in an office? Is that like uh, illuminating or something? <laughs> and even these men, you know, you, you look at them, many of them work at home while condemning the homemaker and the homeschooler for having her children at home uh, because their minds are in this liberal, uh, this liberal frequency, you might say. So it's too confining and strict for people who go the way of the culture and not the way of the Lord and who are not wise about women and daughters. How precious they are. Too precious to farm out to work for someone else. Too precious not to be with, within your presence on some days, but then send them out on other days for spending money. Of course you know scripture, uh, and this is in sarcasm. This is sarcasm, okay kids? Well, when they start to argue with you, you'll say, oh, well, of course, you know, Scripture has all these exception clauses <laughs> that, that only you worldly people can detect. And simple Christians like me really can't see it because we're, too, we're too, too restrictive and narrow. We believe in God's Word, not the worldly objections to God's Word. And then... Um, so, 
if it doesn't suit you, you just reinterpret it. Or you look uh, at the exception clauses or the loopholes, or you look between the lines, you know. And it's, it's like we've always said, um, and you get tired of this illustration, that uh, when Noah was told to build the ark, he, God chose a type of wood, acacia wood. And he didn't have to go, because you'll hear people say, well, God doesn't forbid it, this or that, whatever it is you want to do, uh, God doesn't forbid it. You don't see scriptures that say, now, Noah, I said acacia wood. I didn't say oak. I didn't say spruce. I didn't say birch. I didn't say on and on and on. Uh, that would have been like up to the sky full of paperwork <laughs> telling him what he couldn't use. But what we do is we say, what does God say? And let's get as close to that as we can. And um, it's the gold standard, okay? Uh, but the way the world makes us look at it is that keepers at home are people who are locked up. That, that is the way the world looks at it. And then they just really don't see the irony of uh, the difference at work. You're on a, a worker schedule. You can't leave that building and just wander off somewhere and, and, and do what you want to. Um, you have to clock out and everything like that. And uh, whereas the homemaker, she's got the, she's got the freedom to go go and come as she pleases and she's got freedom and to do what she wants um, so if you think making uh, that that people are making scripture more than it is uh, what about obeying it is that make it more than it is what about you know the cooking that I do is that making more of scripture than it is uh, well it's just showing that how much see keepers at home involves it doesn't say what you do. It doesn't say, oh, you have to wash dishes and you have to it says managers of the home. Well, pretty soon you figure it out. I've got to do some grocery shopping. I've got to do some cooking. I've got to learn how to, you know, handle this and handle that. And I've got to learn how to buy clothes. And I've got to learn how to take care of the house and different things. It's a huge job. Um, so it's just so strange to hear these kind of things. But, you know, they were around. These, these sayings were around. Uh, so like like the scripture that says, uh, if I don't like it, then, you know, that's my scripture. If I don't like it or if I have an opportunity for something else, that's that's, that's my scripture. So uh, but what uh, what you can tell some of these people is, oh, yes, you see it there between the lines. I don't you know, you've got this special insight because um, you're so culturally open minded and we keepers at home as Christians are just too practical and trusting in the Lord. And we know, uh, according to some re religions, that the word of God isn't to be taken too literally. And it's too bad my parents took it so literally and my mother was at home. Too bad I was raised to be a keeper at home and it imprisoned me. Will we uh, be... Um, and then, th then this other thing that really um, confused me was working outside the home helps them know who they are yes I couldn't answer that so I said please send me a sermon on it and try to convince me <laughs> or you know send your blog post or whatever it was she was trying to tell me and then also here's an observation you ladies might make if you've got children at home that are being tempted or lured away from home into a different philosophy or just a uh, different uh, things that they have been taught away from their rooting and their grounding um, when they're doing wrong they react so that every admonition to turn back or every little bit of conversation is is uh, like if you say Are you sure you want to do that that becomes a, uh, an attack you smeared them you uh, you vilified them See, when, when someone is in the wrong, they're very sensitive, and everything is a criticism. Everything is attack. You can't even call and say, well, how are you, um, or anything like that, because it feels like a threat to their authority, and they've taken authority over their own self, but actually somebody else is always in the picture. It could be, a, could be a, an employer. It could be a recruiter. It could be a religion. It could be anything that have pulled them away, and uh, so anything you say sounds like an attack. And they'll say, I'm just going to, you know, um, I'm just going to cut you off. So you can't change God's word to fit your agenda or uh, change God's word to fit your plans or your, uh, you know, your ideas. 
You must change your actions and decisions to fit God's word. However, you can be blinded by your own ideas and your own authority. And even the smallest plea to reconsider will be will be interpreted as a threat. And so I reminded of the scripture, Hebrews 19.39, But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. And uh, some people don't want to say anything when, when someone's giving them a hard time, but you know, you might have a friend or you might have a, something to refer them to that might help. Um, and I think I might have had uh, another thing here that I wanted to uh, to tell you about. So the other thing uh, was that I was going to read to you about Philippians 4.8 and this goes along with choosing what is right and choosing what is good. And what did Joshua say? Choose the one you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I remember the men in the old days would say, nobody in my, none of the girls in my house will ever have to work out. You know, there are special circumstances. Yes, we all realize that. Uh, and and one homeschool school girl, her mom wanted me to talk to her. And she pulled out the Ruth thing, you know, and everything. And I said, your mother uh, is the one you need to be like. And she said, well, uh, Ruth, uh, she just, they always change the subject, you know. Ruth, Ruth uh, worked in the field. And I said, um, Ruth's husband and father were not dead. I mean, Ruth's husband and father were dead. Your father is not dead. And uh, you don't have a husband yet. You're still under your father. And this is the problem is that since the since about 70 years ago, uh, the young girl has been separated, had that separate lifestyle between leaving her father's house and getting into her husband's house. Uh, it's a time of terror and poverty that can be prevented if the parents allow her to stay home and save her money. Then she has something to bring into her marriage. I know a girl who stayed home and... Instead of saying, well, what am I supposed to do, you know, at home, you know, I'm, you know, now that I'm such and such an age, she uh, looked for things to do, and she found, she got into antiques, and she started buying her furniture, storing it up in the attic, so that when she got married, she, her husband said, well, I don't know uh, what we'll do about furniture, and she says, oh, I've got all that stuff, <laughs> and, uh, and she had already sewn things for a baby, and uh, she just, just because she wanted to know how to do it. Maybe she wouldn't have used it uh, later on. But ladies, uh, when uh, we were at home, you know, back in the olden days, and we were children, our parents didn't expect us just to do a specific job and then quit. They would say, when you've done that job, when you've cleaned the sink, look around and see if there needs to be some sweeping done. Look around and see if something else is, it has to be done. And that's, that's a work ethic. You know, they have that in the workplace. You can't just sit around after you've done one job. You have to keep looking around for things to do, things to put away. You see these women in the shops uh, that are hired that take their job seriously. Um, they don't stand around. They, If there's no customer, they get something out of a box and put it in a shelf or they'll rearrange a shelf. They're busy all the time. Well, you could do that at home. You could be that way at home. And I wish I had more time to actually, to actually read to you uh, about this subject. And uh, in a way, I've covered homemaking and other people right now because other people like to interfere, you know, with what you believe, and they totally object to your um, your influence is what this. So here's a lady that wrote to me after I sent out that little newsletter about Ruth. She said, "I loved this article. Also, Ruth was not working or employed by." For another person. She was self-employed. Very good point. Your daughter wants to work self-employed. Serving her mother-in-law, her household, by gleaning. She wasn't under a manager or a boss. She wasn't even working to cut the grain. She was just picking it up. Sort of like picking up food at a food bank. The hard work was already done and she was just picking up her daily supplies. The food was provided by her mother-in-law's relative. So this was provisioned by a male family member. Hmm, yeah, 
She's the one that ought to be uh, writing on my blog. She's the one that ought to be broadcasting. She is this friend of mine who has this wonderful voice, wonderful radio voice. This is not a job where Ruth was hired and given daily wages. You cannot count this as a job. Anyone who thinks that doesn't understand the spiritual teaching of the Bible regarding widows, providing for one's family, and the spiritual laws in making a dignified way for the poor. I also believe a deep dive into what Titus to a Titus to woman, a keeper at home, from a spiritual perspective is needed. The natural application only is the tip of the iceberg. The multifaceted layers of a Titus to woman has a prism effect. Those with limited teaching and understanding can't see beyond one or two aspects when there is a wide spectrum hidden within. She's really smart. She's, it's too heavy for me. Okay. I would clarify so as not to create confusion. Ruth was not self-employed in the traditional way we view it, whereas income is produced for food, where, whereby income is produced for food or money. She actually volunteered to go pick up food already laid out for her. There is such a difference that it's being twisted into a job she never held. Let's see what else she has to say about that. She's brilliant. Um, I don't deserve. I don't deserve her. <laughs> She's a friend of mine I've known for over 20 years, and she just, she's such a, a good thinker. She has good, clear thinking. And uh, so let's see if there's anything else that I could, uh, oh, goodness sake, there was something else. So we will go a little further, and uh, this is a bit more serious. It's probably not going to calm you down, and maybe you can listen to it uh, with, without the children. But I'm going to read a book to you called Women's Lib by by Taylor Caldwell. In the 1960s, she was a brilliant uh, writer of fictional novels, but she often used the Apostle Paul as a backdrop or the Times of Christ as a backdrop, and she wove, wove fictional stories about it. And uh, at the time, we, we thought she was pretty neat. We, and they were clean. They were really clean. Um, but they showed the folly of a foolish man and a foolish husband compared to a wise and good man. And uh, she had discovered... Uh, she had an inkling something was wrong because the men of the era of the 1960s were starting to, quote, catch on to what she called women's, uh, she called it women's con game. Now, that's a figure of speech uh, from the beginning of time. She said what women have been doing for the beginning of time was getting the men to be the, uh, the breadwinners and to take care of them. And um, so she was just using that as a sarcasm, as a sarcastic thing. And she says, and the liberation ladies are making sure that these men find out. And uh, so the men are saying, well, why should we uh, work for to take care of a wife and children? Let them work. And she used the, the little phrase every now and then throughout this. It's only a six-page book. And she'd say, uh, and then she would hear the, the hue and cry of the 60s let them work, you know. And so I want to read some of this to you. Some of it's a little bit too harsh and graphic. Um, and it is on uh, my sidebar somewhere, I think. Um, and it's, um, she says here that she grew up with a mama that was a liberation lady. And, uh, so she never was. She never grew up like so many of you have homeschool daughters. We've taught them how to be feminine, and and that's another one of my objections to these young girls going to work. Are you going to wear clothes like a man, and uh, and go go to work like a man, or can you continue wearing your pretty dresses in these places and and spread your feminine influence? And if you do go outside to work, what effect is this going to have on other weak young women at home uh, looking to your example? So here it is. I'm just jealous myself. This is an author. And the reason she had to write because she had a weak husband that uh, that wouldn't work. And, and the reason she says that he wouldn't work is because she was making money. So he didn't feel the urgency to work. You see, if a, if a woman will work, a man will let her. And... Uh, I am just jealous myself, having been deprived by circumstances from getting into that big, alas, 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 game of homemaking. But I've stood on the sidelines and seethed with envy. And now I hope, I say with a grin, 
that the Liberation Girls will get exactly what they want. I am convinced that the Liberationist fem females, judging from their photographs at least, and on some personal observation, are so unattractive mentally, physically, and in personality that they are envious because they can't even qualify to be taken care of, and so don't want other women to wallow in it with their sweet smiles. As for myself, I'm only wistful and plenty happy that my two beautiful daughters are in on it and enjoying every minute of it and wouldn't even dream of female liberation. I Now, this is written, I think, in 1962. Uh, I brought them up to appreciate their blessings and to shut their mouths around their husbands for fear the boys would catch on and demand liberation for themselves, which is exactly... Now, you have to realize this is done with a sarcasm, um, which is exactly the calamity these rampant females in the liberation movement are going to precipitate. God help the contented women who will be their victims. The liberation ladies would have just loved my mama, who was very advanced and ultra-modern, perhaps even more than most women today. Mama believed in rearing girls exactly as boys, and no nonsense about the weaker sex. And the softer yearnings in a girl's heart. Mama believed that what a boy could and should do, a girl could and should do also. And if a girl had softer muscles and more tender feelings, well, that was tough. So I reared, I was reared just as my brother was reared, except little brother was somewhat smarter than I was and ran his own con game against Mama and succeeded to an enviable extent. From early childhood, I hauled heavy scuttles of coal in from the coal shed in England for my parents' fires. The housemaid refused to do it. It's a man's job, she would say, but Papa, having a dominant wife, lay down on the job. Mama, who had a convenient memory, forgot that what a man can do a woman can and did not haul the coals. She remembered that only when it came to me. So I did the hauling and nearly pulled my arms from the sockets of, in the rain and the snow and the harsh winds of a British winter. I did notice that the young daughters of our neighbors did not stoke the fireplaces and drag scuttles, nor clean out the fireplaces in the cold gray dawns. The fathers and the boys of the family did this, while the mamas and the daughters stayed snuggled up warm. <clears throat> My first resentment began, but being a discreet child, excuse me, I have something in my throat. <coughs> uh, <clears throat> being a discreet child and knowing the weight of Mama's hand, I said nothing. Ah, Mama was a real liberation movement in herself. And when we came to America, Guess who did most of the stoking of the huge furnace and the carrying out of ashes? Right, I did. There's nothing wrong with you, Mama would say roughly, when I felt I would collapse. What a boy your age can do, you can do too. Girls are just as strong as boys. You're not going to pamper yourself as long as I'm around here. That's what I say first thing in the morning, ladies, when you get ready, pamper yourself, because it is a buffer for stress. Then there were the enormous snows, often reaching four feet, almost as high as I was. I had to take the weighty coal shovel and get rid of that snow all by myself. No coddling here just because you were a girl, said Mama. See how she echoes the liberation ladies of today? Well, this is interesting to me, though, but because the liberation ladies of my era weren't fighting to uh, chop down trees or uh, work on the highways or farm or uh, dig ditches, they wanted the executive jobs. They wanted, uh, you know, the comfortable jobs. <clears throat> my ears would ring and my arms scream with exertion and my heart would pound in my throat. Neighbors would notice with outrage, but when one of them complained gently to Mama, she would say sturdily, what a boy can do, a girl can do. No cosseting in our house. When I was 15 and an adult, Mama decided that I was quite old enough to go to work at the first work I could obtain. I was an adult and I should have a job. So I pulled out of school and was sent job hunting and I found a heavy laboring work in a factory six days a week, 12 hours a day. 
Why shouldn't a woman do the same work as a man does? The liberation ladies and my mama often asked. Girls, I wish you had uh, had a mama like mine. You'd be silent these days instead of noisy and stupid. I stood on my feet for those 12 hours a day at a machine, bending and stooping and hauling, in danger from wheels and lathes and whatever. I worked like a man, all right. It was around this time I first noticed that boys were not as all, all as objectionable as little brother and that some boys did resemble Papa, did not resemble Papa in the least. The first feminine instincts began to stir in my 15-year-old heart. The boys were in the factory, and sometimes when they saw me panting too heavily, they would force me to sit down for a few minutes and take my place in mercy at the monstrous machine. And it was about that time that I began to dream of someday marrying a kind and considerate husband who would cherish me and know me for a female and not a liberated woman and take care of me and love me and hold me as a precious person and and buy a pleasant house that I could keep and I'd have nothing to do but housework and taking care of children. Children quite unlike little brother and shop and cook. I would no longer have to be anxious about car fare and worry about my allowance if my allowance would cover my lunch and I'd have pretty clothes and be protected with no effort on my part. Alas, alas, alas. After work, the snow shoveling, the carrying of ashes was still my job. And to do this, uh, and added to this, had been the outside window washing, gutter cleaning, grass cutting, cultivating, and shingle repairing. Papa prodded by Mama was quite an overseer. He would stand smoking his pipe while I teetered on a long ladder and pounded shingles and nails into the roof. And he directed my efforts. Papa, too, would have loved the modern liberation movement for women. Frankly, I think he and Mama invented it. When I infrequently complained, pleading exhaustion, Mama would toss her head with a triumphant warning smile and say, What a man can do, a woman can do. There's no difference. Just once, seeing Papa hanging up the laundry, I sarcastically remarked, And what a woman can do, a man can do. And this earned me a clout from Mama. My Aunt Polly and my Uncle Willie. This is one of my favorite parts of this, this little booklet. I just love this scene. I'd like to paint a picture of it. That would be, if I had you in my literature class, like if I had a literature class and I was in a university and you girls came, you would have to paint a picture of this description. My Aunt Polly and my Uncle Willie lived not far from us. See, this is just coming out of these older people of her time did uh, remember the Victorian era. My Aunt Polly and my Uncle Willie lived not far from us. Aunt Polly was not a feminist. She was a lovely, gracious lady with long blonde hair and big blue eyes and a dainty, charming manner. She had mama, too. She had a mama, too, but uh, fortunately a Victorian mama who believed that a woman's place was in her house and she was a queen of her house, and that gentlemen were born for the cherishing, guarding, providing, loving of ladies. To Aunt Polly, ladies were ladies, gentlemen were gentlemen, gentlemen earned livings at business, and it was none of the ladies' affair except when it come to wills and uh, such. Girl children were brought up in the graceful womanly arts of cooking, house managing, child rearing, sewing, embroidering, and civilized leisure. It was a woman's place to be a comforting presence in her home, adored by husband and children alike, and never was she to be exposed to the harsh elements of competition and outside work. You see, this that's another thing. If you get a job, you can always uh, be dismissed from the job. It's a risk, you know. If you're home, it's not likely that you would be dismissed from helping at home. Uh, adored alike uh, by the children and uh, not be exposed to the elements of competition and outside work. And it was incredible to, to her that she should ever be expected to be a partner to her husband. She was above such nonsense. She was her husband's queen, presiding beautifully over the table he provided and over the silver-covered dishes, the contents of which she had prepared herself. As for holding a job and helping out, Aunt Polly would have raised an eyebrow in incredulous amusement. Such things were below a woman's existence. Aunt Polly, clothed exquisitely 
and smelling delightfully of perfume, would go with her redoubtable mamma to a twice weekly matinee and come home to prepare fragrant tea and bake luscious scones to be eaten with homemade strawberry jam. Though she had no modern washing machine and used flat irons and hung out her laundry and had no vacuum cleaner and other aids, she managed to look serene and rested at all times and had many hours of leisure. Aunt Polly was a gentle and lovely wife, a dependent wife with no ambitions to do a man's work in the world. She would have despised the feminists and the liberation ladies, but Aunt Polly was truly a woman and not a grotesque neuter full of envy of the male sex, who have always had it much harder than women with much less physical stamina, stamina and, have been, and have been convinced by women for endless centuries to make life soft for them. You know, um, it's the scriptures that are supposed to co convince us. Unlike our brawling household, unlike our brawling household, Aunt Polly's house was a place of sweet, quiet refuge for a tired girl like myself. Even at the cost of having to go with Uncle Willie to his grim Scots Presbyterian church on Sunday evenings, I would visit Aunt Polly for the soothing joy of being in a real home among soft voices and gentle music, among fragrances and graciousness, topping it off with a real British tea, produced apparently without effort. Hmm. Do you remember that scene in Gigi <laughs> when Gaston came to see Mamita, Gigi's grandmother, and uh, she said, would you like some chamomile? He said, do you have any of that chamomile tea? And she said, yes. And then in one scene, his only word after he drank the tea was, hmm, <laughs> showing his contentment. Um, and I observed that Uncle Willie was masculinely different to Auntie's femininity, elaborately courteous to her, and overwhelmingly loving. And she took care of him in her daintily female fashion. You see, they just they, they compliment, they take care of each other. Aunt Polly was a discreet Scotswoman, so she did not criticize my parents and the backbreaking labor she knew I was doing all the long hours of the week. But once she said to me seriously in her beautifully modulated voice, Janet, the only way out for you is more education and then breaking away. Now, see, I could understand if you girls were being abused like this at home, you know, why you'd want to leave and, and go get a job and be free of this oppression. But mo for most girls, this is not what's happening. It was to, they're listening to the voices that call them, the voices of the world. Remember that song, Dead to the World, to Voices That Call Me? It was to Aunt Polly that I took my literary efforts. Written Now, see, she, did, she wrote at home. She did her literary. In fact, after she became an author, she was home-based. It was to Aunt Polly that I took my literary efforts, written long after midnight and before rising at 6 a.m. to go to work. She would read them closely and carefully, then gaze at me with tender, thoughtful eyes and repeat my need for more education. So I went... Two nights of high school for five nights a week, and believe me, kiddies, at 15, a child, to use modern parlance, I had very little time to sleep or eat after that. There was That's another thing that calls young women from the home is education. Education is always somebody else's agenda. You can get an education by yourself, and you can be self-taught, which is autodidactic, and uh, you don't need to pay somebody else. Uh, it's, education is not some secret that somebody else holds in their hand. Uh, you can get books like this, and, and you can listen to me. Um, there, in those days, there were no adolescent difficulties or traumas. There were no turmoils or rebellions. Life had become a stern business of surviving each day and working and living for the future. The rage still lives in my heart that despite the financial comforts of my family, I was expected to do a boy's and a man's work and no nonsense about you being a girl either. All I wanted to be was a cherished woman, alas. While I worked and studied my dream of being the cherished woman, like Aunt Polly, uh, it grew stronger in me. But all the hard work I had to do since I was a child and the living I had to earn since I was 15, and all the exhortations I had to listen to at home gave me too much independence of manner, too much self-assurance, too much an appearance of confidence. 
See, this is where we're getting into femininity. What is femininity? It's not just wearing a feminine dress. It's feminine man or feminine voice, feminine, feminine um, quietness. And too much of an appearance of confidence. This definitely put off any men who wanted a queen for their houses. A soft and yield. Now, the word queen for their house um, was common in those days. I mean, people object to all this stuff that they used in these this old literature. Um, this definitely put off the men who wanted a queen for their houses, a soft and yielding, gentle, sweet creature like Aunt Polly, a charming hostess, full of musical laughter and kind wit. For such a woman, men were ready to work their poor hearts out, considering themselves blessed. And I have heard many of a masculine men say, I hate my job sometimes, but all I have to do is think of my sweet wife and I don't quit. Uh, because she it motivated him to do that for her. Um, for such a woman, men were ready to work their poor hearts out, considering themselves blessed to do it. But a girl like myself, who knew hard labor, but you know, we women do that for our babies, you know. We get up in the night, we stay up all night with them when they're sick. Uh, we really do things because we're blessed to do it for these precious, precious human beings that God's put in our lives. Um, but a girl like myself who knew hard labor and knew how to earn a buck, had a sharp and independent voice and manner, and was not attractive to men. They did not want a partner and a fellow wage earner. They did not believe that a woman can do anything a man can do, and they were right, of course. So I did not attract the manly men. I secretly adored, and the masculine strong men, the cherishers of women, the protectors of women and children, the admirers of women, the men who believed it was their duty to provide for wives and daughters, for children, the men who built nice houses for their women, who guarded them against the evil brutalities of living outside the home. I attracted the weak sisters among men who subconsciously recognized that here was a girl who would earn a living for them take care of them, protect them, and be the man of the house while they indulged in their sickly physiques and their ailments and their delicate psyches. They clung to me, the creeps, begging for instant marriage with an eye on my paycheck, while the men I yearned for married helpless little creatures who knew nothing of business except that it provided for them. But of course, they had not had my own life and had not had the parents I had. And the training, she means the training that she had. Sometimes it's hard to shake. And if you marry a man that had parents who were uh, very liberal, liberationists and all that stuff, uh, sometimes when he's tired or something, he'll go back to those old, his, he'll go back to his childhood and those old roots, you know, when his mother worked and his father took care of the house. And it can be difficult. Um, at 18, I fell desperately in love with a true man, a man of strength and masculine vitality and courage. He was attracted to me too. But then one night, he said to me, Janet, you aren't the gentle little woman my mother was. My father worshiped her and no wonder. Now see, that was a, that was an expression, you know, worship. Uh, it, it's not, it was not the same word as worship God. And people, uh, would re people today reject all kinds of figures of speech. But if you're over 70, you'll understand. Uh, he said, Janet, you're not the gentle little woman my mother was. My father worshipped her, no wonder. You are too strong yourself and too independent for me. There'd be a conflict in the house. You wouldn't be satisfied just to be taken care of. You'd want to do something on your own and be a partner to me. It's just no use. I was struck dumb at this horrifying statement. I wasn't very articulate then. He gently picked up my hands and shook his head at all the old calluses and as gently put them down. I wanted to cry out to him, but I want to be like your mother. I want to take care of you. I want you to take care of me and deliver me from this hateful job. I want you to cherish me. I want only to be your wife and have your children and keep your house. I don't want a career or anything else. I just want you. But I couldn't say it. I had no words. My rearing silenced me, and so I never saw him again. But I saw the creeps all right. They hung on me like leeches. Charity prevents me from elaborating on the matter. After all, a girl has to marry someone, doesn't she, when her yearning for love and protection overcomes her? And believe me, unless she is a liberated commie, that yearning is natural and heartbreaking. 
I am too old now to have dreams or to hope for them. It was only very recently, however, that I had to abandon the old desperate yearning to be a wife only, loved and cherished and protected and guarded by the serene walls of her house and her devoted husband, her days full of calm and sunlight and leisure, with no infern infernal career to follow, with no one dependent on her earnings. And I look on the ladies who have never been forced to work as I have been, the ladies who are adored by their husbands and provided for by their husbands, who garden placidly, who drive out for lunches and shop and know nary moment's worry of anxiety for finances and never the pressure of making a living for sick dependents. I envy such women. I envy them as I've never envied another human creature. They tell me with their simpers how they envy me and how much you have accomplished, famous and all that. Well, I am just a housewife, and I hate their complacent attitudes. Not one of them would exchange their life for mine, or fame, or not. Some of Taylor Caldwell's books were made into movies, the testimony of two men being one of them. They were brought, I believe that sometimes in her novels she inserted some of these men as characters, just like what well, I always say, you know, when you... Have, when you meet someone who's really, really disagreeing, well, just put it down as another character in your novel. Uh, I told my daughters, marry men who will not permit you to work after marriage. Marry strong men. Now, see, I am saying don't work before marriage because what they'll do is they'll say, oh, she's she's got a degree in this or she worked in this place, uh, so he's thinking about money. And if if she did it before marriage, then I'll let her do it after marriage, you see. And there'll be pressure on her. So I'm saying don't get started doing that. doesn't mean you don't know anything. If you're homeschooled, you can learn to do anything that you would do out there. You can learn uh, finances. You can learn calculating. You can learn how to file. You can learn how to work uh, in any capacity at home. But you don't have to have it on your record that you worked in a certain place. Because it can be, uh, it can be a, like leaving a trail that someone might take advantage of. So uh, think about that. Uh, marry a, a man who will take care of you and cherish you and tell you their, and not tell you your, their vis business. I uh, had told them from the beginning that unless a woman is powerfully motivated to the arts, let's say, you know, she has powerful uh, talent in something, that cannot be denied, she should refrain from going out into the marketplaces uh, with mediocre abilities. Once she has earned a paycheck, I told them, this is a good point, once she has earned a paycheck, I told my daughters, now just because you're, you're not out earning a paycheck doesn't mean you'll not have money. I know lots of women that are homemakers, homeschoolers, and they've got, they've got, saved up a lot of money. Um, because many, in, the, in my day, in the 1950s, the women managed the money. The husband earned the paycheck, gave it to her, and then she had to pay all of his uh, expenses and even sometimes order a tractor for him. Uh, and so they knew how to pinch the pennies and how to save money from that. Uh, I told, once she has earned a paycheck, I told my daughter she is practically doomed unless she can persuade a man that by that that paycheck is only a stopgap before marriage, and she is only too happily willing to throw it over. She must then keep to her resolution never again to earn money outside the house, never again to be a partner shoulder to shoulder with her man, never again to be independent. In short, she should play, she should play the homemaking game with her husband as shrewd and intelligent women have done for centuries. So she's speaking tongue-in-cheek here. It's not a game. We know that. I would say, if I were to write it, I would say she's get as close to the scripture as possible, especially uh, when it talks about uh, being a keeper at home. And a lot of people like to make the Proverbs 31 woman a working woman, but they don't see anything in there. Uh, she made a product, she sewed something, but she gave it to the merchant, and he sold it. She didn't sit in a shop all day. She didn't go down to the market and sell it all day. She was, she minded her home. And uh, so, but people always want to rest that out of her. Oh, she was a real estate agent, you know. Um, and they want to find it in all these other women in the Bible. Uh, because they're not noticing other things. I always wondered why these young girls that use Proverbs 31 as an excuse to leave home and go out to work, didn't realize that she sewed. Why don't you get yourself a sewing machine? Why aren't you home demanding a sewing machine? 
you know, and demanding uh, time off from cleaning the kitchen so you can sew. <laughs> no, no, they never rebel in that direction, do they? So, uh, she said that once, um, once she gets a paycheck, she is practically doomed unless she can persuade a man that it was only a stopgap before marriage. Then once she is home, she must keep to her resolution never again to earn money outside the house, never again to be a partner shoulder to shoulder with a man, never again to be independent. In short, she should, she should stay home and be a shrewd and intelligent woman of the home, as they have done for centuries. I have accomplished one of the greatest success of my life. I have brought up daughters who have manly and cherishing husbands who never wanted to, them to earn a money outside of their home, who have con concentrated on the soul and natural business of women to be good wives and prudent mothers, soothers of the masculine brow, good cooks, pleasant companions, and truly feminine. I wish I'd had a mother like that. And so I'll skip over some of it to end this. Um, about she goes into how the men are listening to the liberation ladies and they're thinking well why should we uh why should we you know put ourselves under this stress uh and uh for for women let them work I and mean, she uses that phrase quite a bit and and i did that was you heard that back in the day um it says here Pick up any woman's magazine, particularly a certain one that was once run by men and promoted good articles and fiction, and which was read by as many men as women. Read there now the articles by shrewd, sly gentlemen who proclaim a woman has as much right to do any of the world's work as men, and much right to a job and career, as much right to be head of the household, as much right. Those boys know what they're up to, the real enslavement of women. Tragically, such near men and the liberation ladies can never crush the longing of a woman's heart to be cherished, to be protected, to be guarded, to be honored and deferred to, to be loved and dearly devotedly, to a true helper, to be a true helper, to be a compliment in her femininity, and to have tranquility. Um, the patroness of beauty and tranquility to be the dear mother of respectful children, to be, as the Holy Bible says, a good woman whose price is far above rubies, the adorner of life, the civilizer, godly with the beauty of spirit long after her youthful beauty has gone. Um, this is the thing that's, that's really important, is that the woman used to establish the limits uh, of the home, the moral tone of the home. And if a man stepped away from what was right, is according to scripture, if he said, well, I know Titus 2 and 1 Timothy 5, 14 and and Proverbs, 30, and Proverbs 31 and, and Ruth, though those women were home and everything, but I think you're reading too much into it and we need the money. And when he steps out of line that way, a woman, uh, it's, it's up to her, because what is he going to do? Shackle her and stick her in the car? Or is he going to go get some, uh, is he going to go get applications for her and force her to fill them out and then shove her into the car and make her go to work? No, you don't do, uh, if you know it's limit, you're limited, by moral values, by scripture, you don't, uh, it, it used to be the woman established the moral grounds on which the men and children walked. The man uh, was a great provider and he established um, policy for the home, but it was often based on what was right. And the woman always uh, knew what was right. And the men can get weak, you know, because they're out in the world and they hear the culture and they can get soft. They can get soft on it. It's up to the woman to keep everybody straight. Um, so, so this article it says, read their articles by a shrewd, sly gentleman. And he says, um, she says, those boys know what they're up to, the real enslavement of women. Tragically, such near men and the liberation ladies can never crush the longing of a woman's heart to be cherished, to be protected, to be guarded in the home, and uh, to be the civilizer, godly, with beauty of spirit, long after her youthful beauty is gone. And now here's a sad story coming up. Uh, 
But just be patient. And, and then some of you might be convicted in your hearts that uh, you need to guard more carefully your freedom at home and your daughter's freedom at home. And sometimes you'll say, well, yeah, you can go you know, over here and work you know, for an hour in this place or whatever. You realize, don't you, that that is one step out the door on a slippery slope. And, uh, you know, there will be plenty of time. There will be plenty of time after they're married for them to figure out uh, the great um, responsibility of managing the finances at home. And uh, so it's not like they're missing out on anything. I've sold, I've sold and sold many things, but it often is to the neglect of the home. Somebody will order a dress or something and I'll sew it. And then I realize, no, I didn't have time to do the dishes. I didn't have time to feed anybody. And um, so, I, and people will argue with me. You know, they'll say, well, you could just get your kids to do all the housework. And then you could make all this stuff like you're a factory and sell it, you know. Um, but see, there's heart that goes into my housework. I'm not just over there mechanically washing the dishes. I'm thinking a lot. And I'm thinking a lot about the things that I'm doing, and uh, th there's more to it than just uh, you get those dishes done. You, We cannot approach homemaking as a material thing. It's a spiritual thing. It's deeply spiritual. You can tell the difference in two houses. A woman who has approached it with a loving attitude and a woman who's just trying to get the job done, there is a completely different atmosphere. Let me continue. This is the tragic part of the story. It says, um, It is a woman's nature to make a sanctuary of love and delight in her home. This is the true career for women. Alas, alas, that, that so many multitudes of women are now forced, because you see this uh, longing to go to work became forced work after a while or choose to abandon that career at home and to become imitation men in society. The true men won't marry them. The creeps will throng about them. They will reap the bitterness I have had to reap, though I never wanted a career, career never wanted to be stalwart. I just wanted to be a woman at home. You really can't change human, human nature and the instincts of that nature for good or evil. I know a prosperous young man in New York in his early 30s who has a penthouse and is up to date on everything, including the ladies' liberation. He highly approves of it. He told me it's time that women stop being parasites. Now, what is it they call it today? Um, I forget what they call it. They don't call it parasites today. I've, I've forgotten what the word is they're using today. Um, and worked to the day they drop dead or retired, as men do, and not expect a man to support them. He's very enthusiastic about women's liberation and always manages to find a girlfriend who agrees with him. He belongs to a key club. You know the kind I mean. When I was in New York recently, he invited me to meet his girl at dinner there. The girl happened to be a member of an advertising agency. She was a smart, pretty cookie with swinging hair and bright cheeks and eyes and good manners and an engaging way with her. Only her eyes were vulnerable, soft and tender, as she gazed at my young masculine friend. The love light shone in those eyes, deep and passionate and devoted. I thought these two hit it off wonderfully well, and I thought, too, what a wonderful marriage they would make and what handsome and intelligent children they would have. After all, the girl came from a good family and had a master's degree in publications and advertising and money of her own, and I could plainly see that marriage was fixed in her own ardent wishes and hopes. When she went to the powder room, I said to my sophisticated progressive and with it young pal, Are you going to marry Sally soon? He looked at, at me in absolute shock. Suddenly the primitive man was there and not a modern man with a dinner jacket. He was aghast. He said, Excuse me, you can't be serious. Sally's all right. But after all, she's a modern, modern liberated girl. And then when I stared at him cynically, he got a little mad. Let's face it, he said, the liberated girls have made their own way, and we men love it. But if they think we are going to marry them, they're due for an awakening. No man wants a woman who's completely independent like that. When we marry, we want a modern. We don't want a modern woman. He laughed again. Well, we encourage them to be liberated. Uh, 
But Sally came back, glowing at the boyfriend, her heart in her eyes. No one ever told Sally she was being used, that her womanhood had been cheapened and degraded by her sister women in the name of liberation. Sure, Sally had her identity, as they wickedly call it, and her freedom, and she was feeling fulfilled all right. <clears throat> she had her good job and her independence and her nice little apartment, and she was 27 years old, and she, she would soon be middle-aged, and she could... And all she could marry then <clears throat> would be some liberal creep eager, eager to live on her salary. <clears throat> the young man now opposite her, with his urbane manner and excellent income and ambitions, would never marry Sally. He would marry some sweet, untouched creature who would not stand shoulder to shoulder with him in the battle for life, but who would make him a pleasant little wife, of whose decency he would be proud, and who had never heard the phrase, women's liberation. Well, I suppose it serves Sally Wright and all her deluded and pathetic sisters who sprint off to work every morning and take care of themselves and are as free as men, but deep in their deprived hearts they know how tragic they are. Girls, the men are catching on through your sister women who have been liberated, that they can be liberated too. It's up to you in behalf of future generations to lure them back and become again so they can become again superior. Who wants equality with women, with men? No woman in her right mind. Now I understand that a lot of young girls are going out to work, have no idea to be, they're not trying to have equality. They're just trying to learn a little extra spending money. But that's how this all started. And this is how, and if you look back in history, Linda Lichter's book, and, and you start reading about it, it's just, it starts with getting them away from home to earn money. Remember this. The strongest sign of decay in a nation is the feminization of men and the masculinization of women. Now, you will not be allowed to dress very femininely wherever you work. If you go to a grocery store, they all wear a uniform. The men and women wear the same color pants, the same color um, shirts. Uh, it's the same thing. It is notable that in communist nations, women are exhorted, and this is written in the 60s, Women are exhorted and compelled to do what traditionally has been men's work. American women, some of them, feel triumphant that they have broken down the barricades between the work of men and women. I hope they will still feel triumphant when some commissar forces a shovel or an axe into their soft hands and compels them to pound and cut forests and dig dishes, ditches. I hope they will be happy when a husband deserts them and they must support their children all alone. After all, she shouldn't object to men being free, uh, too, should she? I hope no man will extend mercy to them because of their obvious pregnancies, but will rudely tell them that what a man can do, a woman can do. Uh, the decay and the ruin of a nation has always lain in the hands of its women. So does its life, its strength, its reverence for beauty, its mercy and kindness, and above all, its men. And if you remember the poem, God give us women, uh, and it was about how whose, whose virtues are uh, like gold, whose homey virtues are her richest dower, you know. Uh, and, and quit saying, uh, the age needs men. God give us women, lest we lack true men. You're raising men. But even if you get uh, one of these modernist men, you have uh, the responsibility to limit uh the actions of because you're supposed to guide and guard the home you guide and guard it you look up that word guard in the uh, greek and it's like a military guard you don't keep your eyes off of you keep your eyes on everything you don't take your eyes off of stuff you don't take your eyes off your daughter you don't take your eyes off of anything and you limit that and you hear men talking about it i i don't know if any of you have uh watched things on youtube but i heard a man say that uh he'd like to go to a certain uh country but his wife's his wife didn't was really reluctant about it because she thought he would end up in the gulag or something but you see she has an influence she, he loves her and he wants her to be feel at ease and to be happy and he's not going to go and do things that upset her and uh so ladies pay attention to stuff like that and i will try to find you the link to this so you can read it again perhaps uh perhaps click it off i did uh, skip over some of it because it was a little bit too graphic for if your children are listening. So ladies, I love you. Thank you for everything you do. I hope I didn't miss out on anything, but 
I'll talk to you later. Bye. Stay close to Christ.